Hello there, my name is Bruce Rain from Braggus Creations and thank you for joining me today on an unusual live stream day for me. I normally live stream on the weekend out here. Uh, today is a reactive live stream and that has to do with the fact that I got something in the, in the mail yesterday. Um, I was actually planning to do a live stream yesterday but by the time this thing arrived it was getting a little bit late and so I ended up, uh, I ended up then having a very lengthy chat with the Macyak guys. Um, and that gobbled up all my time, and so then I pushed the live stream to today. So, quick little shout out and say hello to Nate is here, and Retro Techie is here, and Seb Mac, and Michael Mullet's here, Eric is here, Patrick is here, Jay is here, g'day Jay, um, and, um, and Trina is here, hello, I haven't seen you here in a while, Trina, what's all that about? Um, so, um, or maybe you have been here and I just haven't seen you, but anyhow. Um, so anyhow, this, this is, I'm going to try and keep this reasonably pacey. I've got a lot I want to try and get done in the live stream and I don't have a huge amount of time. So I do want to kind of keep things moving. Um, and it essentially is a live stream. Of, look at all my moustache hairs are growing up my nose here. Look at that. What's all that about? What's all that about? Stay down. Stay down, moustache hairs. Um, so, um... Well, that's good news. Okay, Jared, uh, Toby, hello. Um, who else, who else? Yep, I think that's it. So, pe people who are arriving, please keep saying hello. Oh, chicken has just started making a lot of noise. Sorry about that. Don't know what's got her all riled up, but she is riled up. So, anyhow, what I have here is a Macintosh SE30. And I mentioned in the title of this video that it is a special SE30. And what is special about it? It's mine. Mine. So I bought this one. It came up, uh, someone basically just posted a picture of this in Facebook on one of the, um, the vintage tech channel thingies. And, um, and he said, oh, does anyone know what this is worth? And I absolutely did not want to get into some great big lengthy comment, you know, thread on Facebook about what this thing was worth. So I just immediately went over to private message and just went and, and told the guy all about it. I said, okay, I can, looking at it, I can tell you this is what's wrong with it. I can tell you that these things in mint condition will sell for a lot of money. I can tell you in the state it is at the moment, it's going to need a fair bit of work done to it. Um, you know, and, and he basically, before I'd even kind of made any sort of offer or anything, as you know, I, I did give him a, a rough idea of what I thought it would be worth. Uh, and then he just basically came back and he said, how about X dollars delivered? And he's a fair way away from me. So delivered was a very appealing thing. And I just went, yep, sold. So, um, so that's basically what happened. Shady robot, robot hello. And um, yeah, so that was, uh, shush. Thank you. Um, so that was, um, uh, sorry, chicken. They do this thing, the chickens, they just, something gets, they get a bee in their bonnet about something and then they just make a lot of noise for a certain period of time and then they stop and then everything gets back to normal. Sometimes they do it because they've just laid an egg. But if, I hope it's not as loud for you as it is for me because it's bloody loud for me. Um, so, yeah, so anyhow, um, he packed it up. You know, I paid him via PayPal. He packed it up, he sent it over, packed it up really, really well. You know, just absolutely you know, packed hard with cardboard on all sides. No bubble wrap or anything like that, but all packed really, really hard with cardboard on all sides. Um, and yeah, it arrived in one piece and that's all great. Now, uh, a few little things about this. First of all, we've got a nice little uh, sticker here from, um, oh, where is that? Uh, equipment was proudly supplied by Computer City, 600 Wynnum Road, Morningside, Queensland, 4170. And then an old phone number there that I bet doesn't work anymore. Um, Mike, thank you for joining. Um, and Mike, Mike, other Mike, thank you for joining. So thank you to Mike from Mike's Mac Shack and hello to uh, Mike. I've, I've got to ask you a question, Mike, and I know I should know this because I would know this if I'd have watched um, uh, all the way through, um, uh, what's his name, um, Joe's. Uh, live stream the other day because you were on that. I saw you there. Do I pronounce your surname Roja? I just, uh, you know, being, you know, sort of being of a, a very Anglo background, it could just be Mike Rogers. 
but uh, I just wanted to check. So, um, and, uh, almost at 100 subs, awesome. Roja. Yeah, that's how I would have thought. Ro Rojos, oh, Rojos, okay. Fair enough, Rojos. Okay, all right, We well, now we know. There's another pronunciation of a name for me to forget for the next stream. Awesome. Um, so anyhow, here we go. Let's continue. Let us continue. Um, so anyhow, Macintosh SE 30, um, purchased it, and it has arrived, uh, and it has some problems. As you can probably see from the thumbnail of this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to point this camera down now. We're going to have a good old look at it. And then we're going to talk about what we're going to do to deal with the situation. Come on, camera. Go down. Thank you. Right. So this will flicker in that because we're running at 60 hertz or 66 hertz or, yeah, no, it's about 60, I think, from memory. Let's get a power plug. I can see it. Where are you there? There you are. Okay. So I'm going to plug this in. Now, typically when people get hold of these in this sort of condition, I would, my recommendation would generally be to not do what I'm about to do, not to fire it up. They probably need to be inspected first, but it has been switched on before. So yeah, if there was any damage done, it's only going to get worse. Okay, so switch it on, no sound, no chime. Very, very common for a Macintosh SE30 with capacitor damage. Now, I've got up here, here, a cursor. So we basically know that it's loading up the ROM because I wouldn't get a cursor without, I wouldn't get a cursor if it wasn't loading up the ROMs. So that tells me that the battery probably hasn't exploded because the battery is right near a lot of the data lines and the ROM. And generally when a battery explodes, you're going to end up with, um, uh, you're going to end up with this, just the CMOS CMAC type thing. You're not going to end up with getting all we see here. Uh, now we've got a little drive with a flashing question mark. And of course you can see we have here what is referred to as a jail bars pattern. Um, and very interesting thing about this particular computer is it has two VRAM chips on it. One of them handles one line of eight pixels and the next one high, holds, handles the next eight line of eight pixels. And then the next one and the next one. So they basically, they interleave between the two. So you've got um, one VRAM chip uh, doing one row of eight and one doing the other. And then they just, you know, sort of inter interleave that way. So what this tells me is that one of those VRAM chips has got some problems with it. Now, it's probably not the chip itself. It's probably just uh, some traces, some trace damage or some capacitor leakage. But there's the, the thing. But on the really bright side of things, it works. Uh, you know, asterisk, asterisk next to works. It works, asterisk. Um, Apple's Anonymous, hello. Thank you for joining. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyhow, the... Um, uh, and we can also see this is a little bit crooked, but we can sort that out. There are ways that we can actually make it uncrooked. It's it's not a job that I recommend for everyone because there are a lot of inherent risks in making that straight, but it can be done. Um, so uh, so anyhow, that's that's you know um, that's one good thing. We know that it's loading from the ROM. I mean, I could basically connect up a hard drive here. I could boot an operating system, and it would work apart from this rather annoying jail pattern jail bar pattern. So that's kind of good. This is one of the reasons why I did buy it because I knew it was something that I could fix up. So that's all really good. So that's one thing that needs to be done in terms of recapping, all good. Um, recapping in clean will probably fix it. But what we're going to do now is we're going to open up, we're going to have a look inside and see how it is. Now, a couple of things worth mentioning with this. Uh, first of all, uh, no burn in on the CRT at all. And that in itself is a great thing. It means this thing hasn't, wasn't left without a screensaver for a really long period of time. In actual fact, I have a sneaking suspicion this has not been used much. I've just got, you know, certain suspicions about that. Um, I would love to be able to say that this thing has never been opened since it was made, but I can't say that because the person I bought it from did tell me he took the back off and hit it with a bit of a, uh, an air compressor to blow some of the dust out. Well, no, that's all fine, but it just means that this thing has actually been opened so I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to be the, the first to open it since, uh, since it was made, that sort of thing. But anyhow, that's all fine. There are no expansions on this. There's the little expansion slot. You can see it's, it's still got the cover. So this doesn't have any, um, you know, display cards or any network cards or anything, which is a, you know, I mean, it's nice if you get those things as well, but you're not always going to get them. I should actually mention, just while I'm here chatting away, 
um, to, uh, it's a good idea if you smash that like button. Jeez, I almost got the timing for that perfect, didn't I? Huh? <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so we're going to have to open this up. And in order for us to do that, we're going to need uh, a Torx driver. Now, I'm going to just change over here to the top view for this one. I don't know if it'll be any better, but it'll at least give us a reasonable view. We've got four screws on these. Um, if we were talking about a Macintosh 128K or a 512K um, or a... Um, a Macintosh Plus, there'd be uh, five screws because there's one in the little battery compartment, but this one just has two here and two here. Um, I know you can't see this one because it's kind of blocked. How about I move this out the way here? Hey, how about that? There we go. I'll move it back again later on. This has been retrobited now. Uh... Hello to Pine Tech. <laughs> First to open it on a live stream. That we can say. We can get to that. Now, this is a little 3D printed uh, Torx driver that I made. Um, it's still in refinement. Um, the, there is a, a, a real weakness going on here. Um, and, and I dare say that if I had to go too tight, that would just snap off. I think I'd probably be better off making this with this sort of handle. I think that would just be stronger. But the downside is that my 3D printer uh, can't print more than about... I think it's about that that height. That's about as high as I can go. So it's just a question of whether I can d design something that I can actually fit in to that to that space there. But anyhow, I, this just uses one of these little these little you know Torx bits that just slides into the end there, and uh, and it sort of works. It sort of works. I have a proper one, but I just sort of thought you know it'd be nice to actually three D print one for, for for why not? Scarlet Swordfish, hello, welcome. Okay. Oh, this, what's special about it? Yes, well, see, it, well, this is one of the problems with not turning up on time. <laughs> That's right, I'm only joking. Uh, the reason why this is special is because it's mine. <clears throat> um, I just bought this recently. I don't know if I'm going to keep it. I might end up just flipping it and selling it. We'll see. I don't really need to, um, but we will see. We'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, I'm an I'm a absolute, I'm terrible bloody uh hoarder when it comes to these sorts of things so i mean i may end up just hanging on to it. we'll just have to wait and see what happens right, i'm gonna get a little ziploc bag and put all the bits in it when you're opening these up if they have the little restart reset button on the side be sure to take it off before you open the case because if you leave it on there you're likely to snap these little guys off a bit of a floor in design if you ask me but that's you know that's what happens when you have a kind of an afterthought of a reset button on the outside uh, Jay, good morning from Sydney, Australia. And right back at you from Sydney, Australia, Jay. Not a lot of clues in your name there. Just be aware that there is someone else in the chat called Jay, as in J-A-Y. So just, just be warned that if I'm saying Jay, I may not necessarily be talking to you. I told the wife you're selling it. I didn't tell the wife anything. It just turned up. As far as she's concerned, it could be a, a, a customer's recap. But um, but yeah, I don't know. I, look, I, I, the truth is that I have lots and lots of compact Max, and I don't have a whole lot of place to store them. So I may end up reselling this. I just think it would be quite an interesting experiment to see, um, like if I get this, completely recap it. Recap the logic board, recap the analog board, recap the power supply, put a SCSI 2SD in it, Loaded up with, you know, maybe a dual boot system 7.1, system 7.5. Um, get it clean as I possibly can. I won't retro it because I really don't care about retro -biting. Sell it with a keyboard and a mouse. Put it up on eBay with a starting price of $1 and just see what happens. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a crazy time out there at the moment when it comes to eBay sales. Uh, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that people should be paying that. I mean, as I've often said, I mean, if you get into these vintage collector communities, you will often end up being able to get things for much better prices because a lot of people, they're not out there to, you know, sort of to make a huge profit from these things. You know, they're, they're collectors. If they've got too many of one thing, they might, might be happy to do a trade or something like that, uh, which I have done several times. 
Um, you know, I may even end up trading this for something else. There are some computers that I really want and someone else might want an SE30. See, I really want a Magatosh 2FX. See, I might be able to do some sort of switcheroo and trade this for 2FX. That would make me extremely happy. Um, what else am I after? Don't say TAM. I really don't want a TAM. I want a, I want a 2FX. I'd really like to have a 2X. Um, kind of like a Quadrant 840AV, apart from the fact that I hate working on them. Um, and, of course, they're so brittle. But, anyhow, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Why SCSI to SD versus blue SCSI? Or do you say SCSI to SD is a generic thing? Um, well, that's a very good question, actually. And there's really no reason why I couldn't put a blue SCSI in this. I guess um, part of the reason why... Because uh, I, you know, I, I, I make and sell both of them. So, you know, I, I guess... SCSI's 2SD might be more recognisable if I was to sell it online and say include SCSI 2SD. There might be more people that have heard about them because they've been around longer. Um, that's pr that's probably the only reason why, realistically, um, at the end of the day. You know, as a, the one thing that I've said many times and the thing that I love about the blue SCSI is it's so easy to configure. If I'm selling a blue SCSI, it doesn't matter who I'm selling it to. I, I sort of feel like at the end of the day, they, when they get it, they're going to be able to figure it out and, and get it all set up. With SCSI 2SD, you kind of need to know a little bit more about SCSI. Uh, you, oh, what a surprise. Eric is voting for blue SCSI. <laughs> for anyone who is in the chat who um, do, is not aware of that, Eric is actually the creator of the blue SCSI. So this is, um, uh, this is why he will... Definitely, uh, without any shame, vote for the blue scuzzy. I don't blame him. Okay, so I don't, I've undone the screws. I now want to take the case, take take the top of the case off. I'm just wondering if this might we might be better off with a front view for this one. Um, um, here we go. We'll bring that down a little bit. Now there are lots and lots of different ways that people open up these cases, and obviously the absolute no no is putting a screwdriver into the top and twisting it because you will damage the uh, the plastic. It's quite soft. And thankfully it doesn't look like anyone else has done that. But I mean, I have had, I had one brought to me where it was just mangled all the way across the top. And I felt so sorry for the poor guy because I mean, he was really, he really liked this Mac. He was so happy to have it, but he'd got himself into this obviously very frustrated state trying to open it and ended up, you know, sort of, um, damaging it all the way along there. I won't tell you the, the, the mistake that he made because he, you know, he was very embarrassed about it, but, um, but yeah, so anyhow, that was, uh, that, that's, uh, that's a good thing about this, that it's still in one state in, in good state. But what I do to open these up, it's just the method that I use and it's not necessarily the method for everyone, but I basically just put one hand on here. It helps to have great big puffy hands like I have. I put one hand on here. I get, all four fingernails in into the groove there, hand on the top here, and I go like that, and it always works. I've never had one that is uh, that I've actually not been able to open using that method. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, there, there are ways you can tidy up that sort of that sort of damage. I know that because I did actually buy a Mac Plus that had some of that on it, not from me, but from someone else. And yeah, you can very carefully cut off the little the, the little burrs that are sticking up. You can definitely do that. It'll never be the same, but it'll potentially be a little bit better. You can help me out with a 2X or a 2FX as I have a few. Probably not working now, so I'll have a chat with you about repair fix and maybe keep selling. Sounds good to me. Do get in touch, please. Okie dokie. Oh, something fell down. Oh, what's that doing on the floor? You're not meant to be on the floor. Whoopsie. Okay, so he's open. Um, we've got a lovely little RF shield here. I hate these things. I hate them. But there it is. Um, might go back to the top view now. We looking down into the guts of it. So we've got power supply here, we've got analog board here, 
there's the anode cap. I would probably, it would probably make sense to discharge it, even though this is a model with a uh, bleeder resistor, it will actually discharge itself as long as it's all working. <laughs> I do like to just be safe with this stuff because, um, well, you know, we're talking about hurty voltages. So I'm gonna just put this under the anode cap, give it a little tap there. I've got the other end of this wire connected to a ground and we're all fine there. So no high voltages inside there. The other, of course, really high risk area is around here. This little board attached to the back of the CRT. If you tap that, you can snap off the glass and you'd be in a world of hurt. Um, okay. It makes Cambodia look like Kansas City. Okay, let's have a look see at this. Now we've got the what looks like to me the original hard drive inside, so that's all kind of cool. Um, I'm going to whip that out and we'll have a look and see how he goes. I can still see the little connectors so for the LED light at the front. Now I didn't hear anything in the way of hard drive sound when I switched this on, so even though this is connected to the power, I don't think it's spun up at all, which suggests to me that this controller is probably stuffed. Um, You've broken the nipple twice on two machines. Oh, yes, no, you can only break it once. Um, I've done it once. I did it in the 90s. Haven't done it since. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm due for another one. I do have one spare CRT up there. I, I, have, got, I have got enough spare parts for me to do it one more time. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really don't want to. I can see a bit of dust in here. So, we're going to have to get this board out. The first thing I need to do is disconnect the floppy cable and disconnect the SCSI cable. I should also mention that one of the other things that will need to be done with this computer is, of course, um, restoring the floppy drive because it will almost definitely be stuffed, uh, but that can be done. Uh, when you're working with an SE or an SE30, there is this metal thing here held on with one screw there and two screws there. This is the bracket where you can put any, like, like a network port or something like that. If you're working with these things and you're not used to working with them, take this off, you get more room to move inside here, you reduce your risk and all that sort of stuff. So I'd recommend anyone starting off working with these, take this bracket off. Um, okay, so I've undone the SCSI and I've undone the floppy and the rest I'm gonna undone when I take the board out. The board has these little grooves here. So when I lift this out, pull it backwards, this, 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 my picture's just always in the wrong place today. There we go. When I uh, lift it up, you'll see these little grooves here line up with the little metal tabs. So I'll pull that out until they line up like that. And then that allows me to lift this board out. Up a little bit further. Yeah. yeah. Lift the board out like that. And then it's, it's free. Now, it's not free free because it's still connected to the power connector. Uh, the power connector is really hard to get to while the board's still in place. Unlike an SC, you can do it quite easily. SC30, it's really hard to get to. So um, I tend to do it like this. Where I, uh, uh, yes, yes. Oh, I get my hand in here, my big fat hand, and I, you can't see this, sorry. And I press the little, the little um, clip that's holding the power connector on, and then I just pull the board away. And then we've got a little sound cable there as well. And then we've got the logic board. I'm gonna put the chassis down. We're gonna have a look at the logic board and then we'll come back and do some other things with the chassis later on. Oi. Wah. You are. Let's move that to there. Thank you. Okay, so here is the logic board. There are a few things I can tell you about this straight off. First of all, it is the first revision uh, because it has a socketed CPU with a little gold bit on it. Um, it, whereas the later models, the chip was actually soldered onto the board and was black. The other big difference is that there's a little capacitor here on the later revision. This, this capacitor is actually on this side of the ROM sim. So there's those differences. And then of course the other thing you can see is there's no writing on the top of these caps. I know you, you probably wouldn't be able to see the writing either, but you can see they've got no little line marking on them or anything like that. That's because these are the really early ones and the information about the caps is actually on a yellow label wrapped around the caps, which of course melts and gets sticky when you're removing them. It's a real pain in the bum, but that's just how it is. And the other thing is this has, I can actually see it here. This has the little blue bodge wire. So it's a little wire that goes from in here, runs across here and then to there. If you remove this wire, your screen ends up as a 
it's a, I think it's either a white horizontal line or a white vertical line. I can't remember which one it is. But if you disconnect that wire, your picture just goes flat. So it needs to be there. Uh, it was obviously some sort of manufacturing issue and they had to go in and put this little revision in when they brought it out. Um, okay. Now, obviously one of the really, really good things about this is the fact that the battery is still intact. We're gonna actually test, test the voltage, see how it is. But that's got the original PRAM battery in it and that battery hasn't died. There is dust all over this thing. If I just give it a bit of that, I mean, it's, you can see where I've just cleared a little bit there. It is really, really, really dusty. Um, these look like 256 kilobyte SIMs, which means we've got one megabyte and one megabyte. So this is a two megabyte configuration. And my guess is that is probably the original config of this Mac. I would say this was probably bought as a two megabyte machine. That tells me quite a few things about it. It tells me that whatever operating system is on that hard drive, it's probably system six based and not system seven based. So I, I would think that this has probably never been upgraded in any way. So, um, so cause this, obviously once we start getting into the system seven, two megabyte doesn't get you far. Uh, considering this is a computer that can go up to 128 megabytes, that's pretty good. And then here's our little ROM sim over here. I haven't been following the chat, so I need to just go back and have a quick look. Uh, send Steve that battery for his collection. Yes, I should, shouldn't I? Uh, Right, okay, just having a look here. Does the SA30 have a bleeder resistor for the CRT? Yes, it does. Uh, the only ones that don't have a bleeder resistor for the CRT are like, the, I think the original 128K and 512K. I think even once they got to the plus, they had a, a bleeder resistor in them, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, uh, if it's a quantum, probably stuck bump stocks. I think it's worse than that, because as I say, it's not even spinning up. But we'll connect it to a power supply in a minute, and we'll just see what happens. Um, do do do. Do 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 The sims look too new for that spec, two times chips instead of eight times. Yeah, but that's because they're 256K. So essentially, um, the, um, if you were to buy a one megabyte sim, it would have been loaded up with these chips. Bum, 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 bum. It's those same chips, but only using two of them to give us the 256K. So yeah, they. I am almost certain they are original spec. I mean, let's face it, who would go to um, you know uh, extreme lengths um, when we're only talking about you know sort of 256K sims? So um, let me just jump across back here. Um, so anyhow, what we're going to have to do with this, we're going to have to recap it, we're going to have to clean it. Um, I'm going to just have a quick look in the microscope in this region here. These two here, they're the two sound chips. These two here, these are the two VRAM chips. And then we've got this whole row of things. And these are the ones that almost always um, end up, you know, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, uh, getting, you know, having problems with trace damage because of the leakage of this cap here. Obviously the sound is not working and that's because of the leakage of these caps here. These caps probably still work fine. I could probably put the, put these, test them now and they're probably still in spec, but I will replace them anyway. First thing we're going to do, of course, is get rid of this battery because it is a teen time bomb. Whip him off. Whip. He's still looking in pretty good condition. Um... Is that the use by date or the manufacture date? Who knows? It says 0589 89. Okay. Let's just check and see what the voltage is for this battery. I really want to try and get that hard drive working because this, it, this really does seem like it is a bit of a uh, time capsule. And I'd love to just see if there's anything of interest on there and not just like someone's poetry or something like that. We are getting 0.3 volts. So that's not quite to the 3.6 volt spec. Um, manufacture date. So that would suggest that it is probably, it probably has been replaced because what year did these come out? It's like 80 something. I'll have to look it up. Look it up. Look it up. 
I don't remember these sorts of things. I know some people do, but I don't. I'm terrible with dates. Pretty good with my own birthday. I know when that is. Uh, models, here we go. View all models. And we want here to be, this is Classic Max. And we've got SE30, 89. Well, actually, introduced January 89. So yeah, no, it is the original battery. So um, yeah, there we go. We know that now. Is the original battery. Do the batteries leak when they're fully discharged or if they still have a charge, can they leak or no? Um, that's a good question. I think it is, it is mainly when they are fully discharged, when they get down to a level of discharge. I think essentially what happens is it, it changes the chemical makeup of them and I think they're then more likely to leak. That's what I think happens, but I could be completely wrong with that. I'm certainly not a, you know, sort of like a chemist. I don't really understand you know, sort of all of the um, the chemical stuff. But I mean, basically batteries are, they're just, a, you know, creating a chemical reaction to, to make the electricity. And when the electricity is gone, that those chemicals ch change state. And so, I yeah, uh, I think they mainly leak when they run out of, of battery. Here's a really interesting thing. There's a very interesting problem that occurs with Macintosh 2s and actually with the original, uh, the original SE. Some of them had these Varta axial batteries. They're soldered into the board, and they're, they're, they're a Varta battery. They're black, and they have the, the, two, the wires, leads coming out either side. Now, those things have the most incredible longevity. Whatever they did with them, whatever the manufacturing process they used, however they made them, is extraordinary, because those things can still hold a three-volt charge today uh, from a computer that was built like 35 years ago which is just extraordinary. I mean, I've had one in a Mac 2, was it no, an SE, Mac SE, put it on the uh, multimeter, still getting over three volts today with the original soldered on battery. Quite extraordinary. Michael, hello, thank you for joining. Um, Patrick, have I said hello to you? I think I have, but if not, hello. Um, so um, the... Um, so the, one of the problems that can occur is because those batteries last so long, um, when you have a computer like that that's not stored in an ideal situation, um, the electricity running through the traces can actually accelerate the um, the corrosion. I don't again, I don't understand the the science of that. But the, 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 um, w when I have often worked on Macintosh 2s, they don't have any battery leakage, but they have this corrosion along all of the traces that are part of the circuit that is powered by the, the PRAM batteries. And, and obviously the, having the fact that they have current in them all the time makes them more susceptible to corrosion. And so they get all of the, the this trace damage just on those traces, you know. And it's not from leakage. Um, it's uh, so yeah. Anyhow, but there are probably some uh, um, some you know special scientific things that, that other people understand that I don't. Uh, at least two Patricks in these chats. Yes, and I've said hello to one Patrick. I just but I don't think I said hello to second Patrick. Um, all right. Now, okay, so we've already checked the, um, we've checked the battery, he's kaput, but the most important thing, he's not on the board anymore, so you can do no more harm. You can do no more harm, here. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump across to the microscope quickly, we're going to have a quick little look at this so you can see just how bad this is from a, a dirtiness perspective, but this will, uh, one thing I can tell you is this is going to come up like new when ultrasonically cleaned because ultimately it's got this layer of dust on it, but it looks quite good underneath. So let's have a look around these caps because we know there's no sound, so there's definitely going to be some ugliness. Okay, well, it's ugly because it's out of focus. There we go. Okay. Well, here we can definitely see we've got some corrosion. And one thing I can tell you is if this was left too much longer, it would be getting even worse. Because if you have a look around here at these traces, they're still bright. Still bright, they're still green, they haven't gone black. So we haven't got to the point where this corrosion has gone in and started eating away at these traces underneath. So that's really, really good. I'm extremely happy about that. Um, then we can move down to this guy here. See, I often see black, oh, well, there's one. There's one black trace just there. 
but I often see that whole trace all the way along here completely blackened. So it's actually really, really good. I'm feeling happy. Um, okay, there's, the, there's our two sound chips. Um, obviously not happy because it's not making sound. And, and this is the row. This is the row of ugliness that we always get. Good old UE8. Hey, UE8. Anyone who's worked with an SE30, you jump onto a, a, a Facebook forum or something like that, a Facebook group, and say, hey, my Macintosh SE30 has a problem with the video or something like that. UE8. That's what everyone will say. UE8. Replace it, fix it, clean it, whatever. It's all around that area. Um, and then, as I say, the uh, then we've got down here, We've got our, uh, our VRAM there, VRAM 1, VRAM 2. So one of these is handling one row of, one row of uh, eight pixels, and one of these is handling the subsequent row of, of eight pixels. So we know that we've got some problems with connections between these things and these things. And it could just be fixed by a simple ultrasonic clean. It could actually be that simple. Um, but, you know... I think with this, this is probably one of the few computers that I may end up actually cleaning before doing too much to it because it is so dirty. Um, it's so dirty, it's actually hard for me to see where there might be problems. I mean, look, grit. Can't even read the serial number. Grit. Um, but wherever it was, it was obviously reasonably dry because it's not too bad. Um, so, da da da. <laughs> what happened to that board that both Steve and Joe worked on and then uh, mailed to Australia? A very interesting thing that you, that, that you mentioned there. And I, I have actually talked about this a couple of times on the live stream. And I've got to, I do actually need to get in touch with uh, Madeline McAndrews to try and get this all sorted out. So um, basically, the... That got posted to Australia in a box with a whole bunch of other things that were sent to Madeline McAndrews. And she's a long way from me. She's, for her to drive here, it's about an eight-hour drive. So she lives, she's not exactly, you know, like a next-door neighbour. Uh, she does regularly come and visit me and give me computers to repair and all the stuff. I've got a few of her computers here at the moment. I've been really dragging the chain with that. I've got to get that sorted. Um, anywho, she got that delivery. And very soon after... Uh, uh, Delta variant arrived and large parts of the country went into lockdown and a lot of borders got shut up and all that sort of stuff and it has meant that she has been unable to drive here and drop it off so it's still at her place um, and we just haven't been able to get it here yet now of course what we should just do is stick it in a, a box and mail it to me just so that we can get it sort of seen to but uh, that's that's where it is and that's why it sort of came to a grinding halt is because We've been in lockdown here in Sydney since June, I think June, late June, uh, and that's a long time. And so that's you know the, the, there are restrictions in place that means that she can't just sort of hop into the car and head over here. So that's that's basically what happened. COVID happened. COVID Delta happened. Delta variant happened. Um, <laughs> Yes, I think it was in Queensland. I can't remember. I don't, can't remember exactly, but anyhow. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Right, so I sort of feel like at this stage, what needs to be done with this board is kind of just the normal stuff. So I'm going to probably do another. I'll do, I'll, I'll, I might come back to it, but uh, we might just look at some other parts of this. I'm going to pull out the hard drive and the floppy drive, and we'll have a quick look at that. But I want to just try and m keep moving along. I'm just going to go back here to top view. I'm going to whip off the RAM. This, these 256K SIMs are not going back in this computer. I can tell you that. I am going to load this up with at least 8 megabytes. So uh, we've got plastic clips here. They're very, very, very fragile. So I want to be as careful as possible that I get these RAM SIMs out without breaking them. Um, nope. Oh, it's also scary, very scary. Um, so 
There we go, we can see these seems what get them up reasonably close to the camera. You might even get them in focus. There we go. And we've got written on the back here, the Motorola. That's the uh, MCM84256S. There we go. So nothing was ever labeled back then uh, in terms of proper labels of like capacities and things. Um, whenever I get RAM, uh, one of the first things I do is I stick a label on it to show what this capacity is. <coughs> Ed's Studio Workshop. Hello. Um, yes, now, okay, so Ed, I'm just going to pop this up on the screen here so that I can respond to it. Um, I am still doing repairs. What I was uh, essentially saying was I had to stop, temporarily stop, taking repairs from people because I simply didn't have enough time to do them all. People were just basically contacting me every day and saying, hey, I've got this board, can I send it to you? And I was just getting this situation where they were just piling up and I ran out of space to actually store all the boards um, while waiting to work on them. Because the thing is, I have a full-time job as a, um, a web developer. And so I don't get to work on this in the normal nine to five. Obviously I am today, but this, it's very special circumstances today. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm talking so fast is because I need to get back and do other work. But, um, um, but the, um, um, yeah, and of course another thing that was happening is because of my, my, uh, my videos about doing all these very complex repairs, I started getting it so that pretty much everything that people sent me was an absolute train wreck. Battery damage, you know, really bad capacitor leakage, trace damage, that sort of stuff. So no one was sending me anything just like a straightforward um, uh, recap. People were having a crack at doing that themselves and then they were only sending me the bad ones. And that's fine, but it's it, it just means it, it just gobbles up huge amounts of time. Um, if I've got a recap that I can do in half an hour, that's great. You know, I can get a bit of a production line going and I can punch out the recaps. But when someone sends me a board that I'm going to, I know I'm going to spend four hours on and I've only got, I don't know, two days in a week to work on them, um, you know, I don't get through many. So that was basically what I did. I just essentially said to people, look, you know, guys, I just need to put a hold on things being sent to me for the moment. Uh, and just until I can try and get on top of things and try and get a bit more of a system going. Uh, and of course I had people s starting to send me um, lots of work in one go. I had a box arrive with like 13 recaps in it. I had another box arrive with eight recaps in it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't blame anyone for doing that, but it was just making it really, really difficult for me. Um, because every job that I was taking on was massive. Uh, I will definitely be making plenty of announcements when I do finally get that SE30 board. I'm really looking forward to working on it, actually, because it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a fun thing. Um, and I hope I can fix it. I mean, if I can fix it and send it back working, how good would that be? Uh, but yeah, I might actually, I might actually get in touch with Madeline and see if we can get that, uh, see if we can get that mailed over in the meantime. Um, I do actually have a board on its way to me. It's supposed to arrive this week, coming all the way from Canada. Um, it is coming from Dan, the Ca Canadian computer collector. And uh, I, uh, it is a recap that doesn't work. So I am going to try and get it working. And we're even going to try and get, uh, uh, potentially get uh, Dan in on the live stream as well. So I'll do the work and he will provide the commentary. Uh, he's way funnier than I am, so I'll have to just stay quiet. Um, okay, so, but you know, I won't stay quiet. Um, all right, so I've got this one all ready to go. I'm, I might just, I, I'm tempted to just take the caps off and then probably chuck it in the ultrasonic cleaner uh, and then do the rest of the recap. Or do I just do the recap? I don't know. I don't know. Should I just recap it? What do people think? Max, hello. Uh, strange people leaving boxes of boards at your doorstep. <laughs> so, interesting thing. My last live stream um, was working on... Oh, it's in, the, it's in there. Was working on an LC2, which was yours, Max. So, and then I've got an LC and an LC2 over here. So, Max is one of the people that left me eight boards to recap. Um, so, uh, and I have done... Oh, six of them now. 
I got five of them done really quickly and then came to a grinding halt and then I got another one done the other day and then I'll, I'll get these ones finished off fairly soon. So they're, but they're, they're LCs and LC2s, which means they have zillions of capacitors on them. Um, so, uh, and of course I didn't see that one. It was interesting. I was thinking to myself, oh, I wonder if Max will pop up on this one, but nope. Um, so yeah, you, you just, you got lucky with that one, Max. But anyhow, it's done. The LC2 is done and it chimed and oh, it's all good and it's been cleaned and over there and stuff. And so, yeah, and I will continue with the rest. So, uh, all good. Um, all right. So, um, power it on, see what it does. We've already done, I have already powered this on. And it, I, the, if you have a look at the thumbnail of the video, you'll see the jail bars. Unless you were talking to someone else. Uh, okay. What's the speed of the Sims? Whatever number is on the chips, I will tell you that right now. That is, they're tens. They're 100, 100 nanoseconds. So, yep. So, you know, we're, we're not talking blazingly fast here. So, yep. Yep, 10. 10 is the number. Um, which would fit with the vintage of this. I mean, that, that would totally fit with the vintage of this computer. Um, all right, so, um, all right. well, I'll tell you what I want to do first. I want to, I want to have a look at the hard drive. So we may come back to this and recap it, but I would like to whip out the hard drive and the floppy drive from the case. Ugh. So we're going to do that now. This thing makes all these creaky noises whenever I move it. I think there's bits of grit and stuff in there. So we've got, oh, what? We are missing two screws from the um, the drive bay, so someone must have removed this at some stage. It's normally held in with four screws. It's only held in with two, so it definitely has been opened before and the board taken out. I've got a little uh, live thing in there by the looks of it. Okay, so let's just take these screws away. I'll pop them in here. Are you sure? Yeah, they probably are my bones creaking, you know. Okay, Trina, thank you for joining, and I'm sorry I'm streaming so late, um, and I shall hopefully see you next time. Okay. They can't be faster than 80s, otherwise they will crash the Mac. You sure about that? I'm pretty sure I've put faster than 80 in them. I have to check. Well, actually, I can tell you, I've got my other SE board here. Ah. <laughs> what speed are these? These are seventies, so I hate to I hate to uh, to come at you with some information that contradicts the information there, but I have seventies in this SE thirty and it works. All right, let's disconnect the power. I might take this off for that, just to be safe. Better to be safe than sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, ah. yeah. It was the SEs that had that issue. Yeah, it could well be SEs. SEs were uh, were a much more sort of archaic machine compared to these ones. One of the downsides to the SE is that it didn't have 32-bit clean ROMs. So essentially what that means is you couldn't easily just switch it over to 32-bit memory addressing. So what that would mean is that even if you put, I don't know, 60 megs in it, it's still only going to recognize eight. Um, you get around that with a little thing, a little utility called um, um, Mode32 little extension you could put in there that would allow you to actually uh, utilize all that RAM. Another thing you can do is you can buy one of these big mess of wires Rominator 2. This one here has 32-bit clean ROM, so if you use this ROM instead of the original ROM, you won't need to run that mode 32 in, a, in order to get 32-bit memory addressing. Right, so this whole bracket comes out from here. We do this very gently so that we don't break anything. And out she comes. Let's put this away now again. 
Uh, uh, uh. One thing I can tell you about this Macintosh SE30 is that if I put only four 64 meg SIMs in there, it doesn't work. So it's got, it's got two banks of four. So you've got obviously eight slots, but you've got two banks of four. So each bank needs to have the same SIMs in it. So you can put like, you know, four, four eights in and four twos or whatever. Um, I've got four 16s and four twos. If I run it without the twos in there, so just the 16s in bank A, it won't work. But if I put, if I populate the second bank, and I've found this with other SE30s as well, I had exactly the same thing happen with a customer's one. He got two, he got his row of 64s in there, put them in there, doesn't work. Fill up their bank B with ones, works. So they've, they've, there's no doubt about the, the fact that they're touchy. They're a bit touchy with the RAM. Um, okay, so we've got two brackets here. We've got the floppy drive and then we've got the hard drive here. We can remove the hard drive bracket just by undoing these two screws. I probably don't need to, actually, I don't even need to do that. It can stay there. It can stay together in one piece. I just want to get the drive out. Now, see, this looks like it's been taken out as well because this would have originally been held in with four screws, not just two. So it's definitely been tinkered with. Definitely been tinkered with. Whoop. Let's just disconnect the, uh, there's a little LED on the front there. And a little, I actually miss LED lights for drive activity. Um, that's something that they had in the early Macs and then they stopped doing. And I missed them. Oh yes I did. Just gonna have a quick look at the chat here, make sure I haven't missed anything of importance. Um, Maybe the twos are bringing the memory speed down. It's always possible. Uh, this is an auto eject drive. It is. Uh, it, it's actually they refer to as uh, inject rather than eject. So auto inject. So what they're referring to is the uh, when you put it in the drive, it it pulls it in. You get to a certain point and then the mechanism pulls it in. So that's the auto inject. Um, the later ones, you had to get the disc a whole lot further in, and that's why some of the later ones had a little, uh, like a little cutout around the drive so that you could get your fingers in there. Um, but yes, it is. This is an auto in that uh, there, th wherever I put it, there is an auto inject floppy drive. Uh, I've restored lots of them. I've, I'm quite confident that I'll be able to get that up and running. Um, Okay, so just I think I'm all caught up. I think I'm all caught up. Um, just remember that if you, oops, I did not want to do that. If you want to, I, I accidentally launched Chrome. I didn't mean to launch Chrome. Chrome isn't your default browser. Well, boo hoo. Okay, there we go. So, um, what year was it from? The computer? It's certainly after January, March, April, after May 1989, because that's the date of the, the battery. The battery manufacture date is May 1989. So we know that the computer, the SE30, came out later than that. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Jay. Um, Recap a Mac, the website is, uh, is the website that I maintain. I'm a, I've been a little bit slack with it lately and I do apologize for that. Um, all right, so this is the hard drive here. Now, one of the common failings in these is these capacitors, they sometimes go, but they are usually go, when they go, they usually go um, spectacularly. I want to have a quick look at this under the microscope, see how it all looks. Uh, I may have a uh, a spare controller. 22 microfarad, 16 volt. Ooh, we've got a little insect in here. We've got a fair bit of corrosion too. And then I'm just having a little look at this. We're gonna, I'll jump onto the mic. I thought I was only going to have a quick look, but now it's long enough for me to actually change the view. Yeah. Okay. Now I probably have one of these around where I can just steal the uh, controller. 
whip it off one and put it on the other as long as I've got one that's matching. And we've got the little jumpers here for setting the uh, SCSI address. And here we've got our little resistors for the, uh, what do you call that thing? The uh, uh, termination. Doesn't look too bad. Let's see if this fuse is still fusing. I just would really like to get this. I love the time capsule aspect of getting an old hard drive working. Yep, fuse is still fusing. And look at that. Hello, little bug. Hey, little bug. Stuck onto the board. I'm going to give this some power, we're going to get a power supply, and we'll get some power and see what it does. Here's a power supply. Always keep a power supply on hand. One third height from a later Mac, it would have come with a half height drive. Yeah, look, I think you're probably right. Um, this is a, oh, it's only a 40, that's something, but... Um, I sort of, it sort of seems crazy that you it would have come with a 40, wouldn't it? Would you replace the 40 with a 40? And keep in mind that SE30s were manufactured for a while. Well, it still is one of the earlier revision boards. Mm, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I'm just, I'm just speculating at the moment. There's absolutely no real uh, factual stuff at all. Um, right. Where'd the power go? Here it is. So I'm going to connect up the power to this one and we're going to see what happens to the drive. That is absolutely dead as a door now. So there is something fairly significant going on with this. I'm very, very tempted to just replace these two caps because I have had ones of these where these two caps have blown up. So one or both of these might be that. So I'm very, very tempted to do that. You with me? Are you with me? There is absolutely no diagnostics going on here at all. This is going with a hunch. It is not the way you should do repairs, but hey, I'm on a live stream. I'm trying to keep things interesting. Do the drop fix, no. No, no, no. The, 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 the computers at the time used to come in a variety of different configurations. So, I mean, knowing the size that it came with, I mean, you, you would have need to have known what they actually bought. And it's, it's prior to the days where they actually had the configuration written on them or on a sticker or something like that. You just kind of had to know there at the time. It's actually one of the really difficult things with trying to recreate some of this information. I know Jay from the House of Moth has this awesome website, which I hope he's going to put a link in for called Apple Serial Number Info. And one of the great things about the Apple Serial Number Info website is it will give you information, not just about what the computer is, but when it was made, where it was made, that sort of stuff. And, and you know, different configurations and all that sort of stuff. And the big issue we have with these is when we're trying to recreate information about these old Macs, they've all been pulled apart and put back together again. And you've got no idea what the original configuration of the computer was, so. Yes, I, know, I noticed the holes didn't line up. Um, I think that's because they put the drive in wrong. I think I can make the holes line up uh, if I put it in correctly. Um, let me just... Uh, so this should go in upside down like that. And, uh, and there and there. No, no, you're right, they don't line up. They don't line up at all. So, you're completely and totally right. Uh, definitely not the original drive. Uh, tweezers on the ground. These are the tweezers I dropped in my live stream from Sunday. <sighs> oh yes, the, I should mention Apple serial number um, info. 
there is a monthly vote on there for uh, Mac of the Month. Um, so jump on there, check it out, make your vote count. Oh crap, look at this. Look at it. This is some sort of weird, crazy cat. I don't like weird, crazy cats. Wow. And it's leaked or something. It's got, um, it's got, uh, uh, what do you call it, goo on it, um, component adhesive, but look, it's actually electrolytic, it's just mounted sideways, that is really weird, I, so I thought this was like a tent, but it's not, and, and when I, when I hit it with the uh, hot air, I could smell it, it could smell the, the stick, oh, Bruce, Smith switch cameras, thank you, thank you, okay, so, have a look at this, this is the cap I just removed. Got two leads here, boom, boom, like that. And then when we look at this, it's actually a, like an aluminium pot. Aluminum. Uh, and that's the stuff leaking out the bottom. So even though this looked like it was a tantalum cap, it's not. It's an electrolytic one. And it's leaking as well. So that's amazing. That's going to make it bloody hard for me to stick a... Uh, a tent replacement on there because you can, as you can see here that there nothing stuck to it that's just nothing it's here negative positive crazy has anyone seen these before anyone i want to open it up because that's how we experiment i just need to get my scalpel i think i left it over here I do that sometimes. I use it for like opening up uh, um, bags of chicken food. And then the next thing you know, it's out, it's out of here somewhere. Hey, try not to break that. Oh, your scalpel. 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 Nope, can't see it. Probably just around here somewhere. Oh. Scalpel. Ah, there it is. Found you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can do this without doing myself a mischief and cutting myself. This is really rock hard. I may not get this out. But anyhow. Um, let's see what we're going to replace it with. That's, I guess, the main thing. Should I stick an electrolytic on there? Or do I even have them? 22 microfarad, 16 volt. I've got surface mount ones, but they have the leads coming out either side. It's going to make it really hard to mount on there. Uh, tantalums, 22, 16. 22, 16, 22. I've got some 22, 16s, but they are altogether the wrong size for that. So let's have a look at my 16 volt container, which I have here. And we'll see if we've got any 22s that might go in there. Yeah, these might go in there. So these little guys here, I mean, they're Sort of a comparable size, and I think I'll probably be able to make them work. 2216, 2216. So let's get the second one off. Charlie, no worries. There's no, there's no such thing as being late to a live stream. That's what I say. Daniel is here. Hello. Okay. 
Okay, so let's get this second cap off and then we'll replace it. And we'll just see whether this makes a difference. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I didn't test that one, but after it blowing its guts out from the hot air, I think it's, it's, if it wasn't wrecked before, it sure will be now. There we go. That time I was able to get it off easier because I knew that the bottom was just being held down with the component adhesive, which we see here. Just got to get this focus right. There we go. This component adhesive often gets sticky, when, you know, gooey when you heat it up. A little bit easier to remove. But let's clean up these pads. We'll put a couple of new caps on and we'll see if that fixes it. It will have been a, uh, a journey of discovery for me if it does fix them, because I absolutely did not realise they were electrolytic. I funked they were pants. Oh. What does it tell you when the smoke starts going everywhere? It tells you I don't have my fume extractor on. There are the two pads, but also a large ground was, uh, was the large pad unused. Now, actually, that's a very good point. You know what? That might actually be the same ground. It, it doesn't appear to be connected to anything. I mean, it really doesn't. There's no trace coming from it at all. It just appears to be a big pad of copper. I mean, I'll be interested to see whether it's connected to ground. We'll test that here when we have a little continuity checker. But I, I think that pad goes nowhere. It certainly wasn't attached to that uh, capacitor. So there's a minus. Oh. Yep, that pad goes nowhere. It's a nothing pad. Okay, so we're just doing our normal thing here when it comes to recapping. We're just cleaning these pads up. We want to make sure these pads end up all ready to accept some nice new solder. So we put the old solder on there, we put flux on there, we heat them up, we give them a bit of a wiggle around nice and gently, be careful not to damage anything, and then... Thomas, what sort of question is that? What sort of question is that? Joe is here. Hello, Joe. Um, we're doing something interesting here at the moment. Well, interesting to me. Could be boring as bat droppings for others, but um, this is a an old quantum hard drive, and it is dead, completely dead. Nothing at all coming from it at all. It doesn't spin up. And I had heard that these things do have capacitor issues, so I went to go take these caps off, and eh, they look like tantalums, don't they? But no, they're electrolytic. They're actually electrolytic inside there. Look at that. What the hell, man? So, I'm going to replace them with some electrolytics. Uh, plonk them there. So we've got our negative side on the left and positive on the right. I'm thinking that I probably should get these pins kind of ready before I start soldering, get them trimmed and whatnot. Is a negative on the left, positive on the right. Well, it's a little bit further down. Boxed electrolytic, messing with my head. 
Yes, this is, these are all SE30 shenanigans, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, it's, I need to recap an SE30. Oh, okay. You know, because you've never done that before, have you, Bruce? So I thought I'd do something a little bit more interesting here, play around with a hard drive. I will recap the SE30. And in case you're wondering, Joe, why I refer to it as a special SE30, it's because it's mine. It's mine. I bought it. I paid too much for it, and I bought it. And no, that other SE30 that's on its way to me still hasn't arrived. It's still in Ballina. Long story. I hope I can get it soon. I want a little bit more solder on that. Fluxerific. There we go. That looks good. That looks good. Ah, okay. I am I am actually very, very keen to get started on that SE30, Joe. Um, we uh, hope it arrives soon. Well, I hope I am able to get it soon. Right, so there's one cap down, and here's the other cap. I'm gonna get him on there as well. Where's the negative? Negative. That's right. Hang on, one. Say, say, one. Plus on the right there. Oh, plus on it. Yeah, okay. All good. All good. Everyone's fine. Everyone relax. It's okay. Zoom out and look to the right at the two missing components. I bet they are for surface mounts. <laughs> I bet you you're right. <laughs> oh dear. Shush. I've gone to all this trouble. Shush. Don't tell me that. Yeah, you're exactly right. That is exactly right. Here is this is a board that's been made so that it can take either a surface mount or an electrolytic. And if I get my little buzzer, go a little busy buzz. I've seen it so many times before, I missed it this time totally, so I apologize. Apologize. There's a positive. There we go. There's a positive. There we go. There's a negative. There we go. There's a negative. There we go. Now, one thing I will say is that I've already gone to all the lengths of getting these caps and I can't use these caps for anything else now. So guess what? We're using electrolytics. But yes, thank you for spotting that. I do appreciate it. Do you see what I see? Hmm. Right, there we go. So, here's one of the more pointless little exercises we've had. I could have just dropped a couple of uh, surface mount tants onto there and I may even do it again eventually because this looks bloody awful. But that's another story. It's all about the adventure, isn't it? Come on, out you come. Alcohol. If I'm lucky, I'll get to finish it for the next marching toss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be really, really ready for the next marching toss. I want to have some really cool stuff, content and stuff ready to go. All right. All right, all right, all right. Let's just dry that out a little bit. 
Let's put some power and see what happens, whether this thing actually spins up. I'll probably take this board off and actually ultrasonically clean it, but we're not going to do that for this little test. No way. There's a fun in that. Top view. Oh, I've got goo on my fingers. I hate getting goo on my fingers. <laughs> it's not quite the same alcohol that I might be, you know, uh, sipping while with a meal or something like that. It is isopropyl alcohol. It will make you go blind. Um, power supply. Now I want to turn off my uh, fume extractor for this because I want to be able to hear if the drive spins up and this thing's bloody loud. So, here's the power supply. Grab ourselves a little Molex connector. Very handy. Everyone should have a couple of these lying around. Just an ATX power supply they're not using for anything else because they're just really handy, you know? They get all those little plugs and get a bit of 12 volt and a bit of 5 volt. And... There we go. Right. Is it going to blow up or is it going to work? Or is it just going to sit and do nothing? Anything is possible. Here we go. Hey. Hey. Wake up. Hey, wake up. I hear nothing. So it is still absolutely and totally dead. So I guess the next thing I need to look at is replacing the controller. But what I worry about is if I can't find an exact 40 megabyte controller and I put it on there, it's going to think it's a different capacity or something like that. Unless maybe that comes out. That's like a firmware or something like that. They could maybe swap that out. Let's even see. Uh, what have I got here? Because I have lots of bits. Ugh. 230. That's not quite the same. I mean, I could get out the multimeter and start checking to see where I'm getting power and where it's stopping and all that sort of stuff. But that seems like so much hard work. Uh, yeah, well, it's, um, if you have a look at this here, with the ATEX won't power on, that's, um, see this green wire? It's connected to the chassis. That's kind of forcing this to always be on. You can see how the fan's spinning. You may or may not be able to see how the fan's spinning, but the fan is spinning. And I'll prove it. I'll prove it because I'm going to put the uh, multimeter on here and we're going to get one little lead here onto the GUND and one onto the 12. Whoopsie. Steady hand, steady hand. And see that we've got 12. You can't see it. Oh, you can just see it up in the corner there. 12 volts and then the GUND, 5. And see we've got 5.2 volts there, just under the logo. So some hard drives won't spin up unless uh, unless it's hooked up. Yeah, now this is very true. Some of them do actually have like an auto start function, that sort of thing. I don't think that is the case with a drive of this vintage. I think this one would just spin up um, when connected to power. That's what I think. We can test that theory though. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Um, and I can test that theory by... Uh, Grabbing my chassis here. I'm going to need a few bits and pieces to test it, but we can still test it. I can connect the hard drive like these. And then we need to get a board, a working board. Here's a working board. Oopsie. There's some scuzzy cable. And let's connect that to there. Okay, that's that. 
I need to go get my extension cable, which is out here. I'll be back in a moment. I'm not going far. Ooh, ouchie. Hello, chicken. Do, 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 do. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Ugh. God, I love leaving myself obstacles. I don't have a lot of space in here, I should just mention that. <laughs> okay, so let's just as I say, well, all we're doing here is just testing the theory as to whether this might actually kick up if it's um, if we switch it on. So so if it's actually got uh, like a computer connected to it saying, hey, tell me something. So I've got this connected to power. You can't see it, it's hanging down. I've got it connected to SCSI. That's connected to the computer here. And this is powered on. This is a good board. This one's been recapped, it works. You won't get any sound because I haven't connected the sound up. But the fan starts and this drive is completely and totally deaded. I recognize that icon. Hello, Dave, how are you? How did you go with your colorful Mac Plus the other day? My goodness, that is a travesty. A travesty, I tells you. So yeah, completely dead hard drive, nothing coming from it at all. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Now, okay, where are we going for time? I'll do a couple more things here and then I'll probably call it a day. I am going to continue trying to get this hard drive working for as long as I can, but one of the things I will need to do is try and track down a controller board. I mean, I have got so many hard drives that I feel like there's a good chance I'll find one with a controller board. I don't throw them away for that one reason. I like to keep them as spares, spare parts, because, you know, ugh, why not? Righty. Chickens and chimes. <laughs> that was one hideous Mac for sure. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh... <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I want to whack. I want to whack this really hard, but I don't want to potentially damage the data because it might have some interesting data on there. You never know. Um, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is just have a very, very quick look at the floppy drive to see what state that's in. Um, it's a nice, easy little job to do. It's an easy job to do if you have the right size screwdriver. Done a platter swap between drives. No, I have not done a platter swap between, between drives. I suspect that if I did that, my I would just end up wrecking it. So these uh, floppy drives, you saw this in the 2CI as well, they are actually, they put them in a little plastic condom here to uh, protect them from dust. If anything, I mean it probably worked, but if anything it just seemed to hold the dust in there, make them more likely to fail. Uh, but anyhow, those ones in pretty good nick, look at that, a little bit of dust, a little bit of grit. This will clean up alright, the front of it is as dirty as anything, this thing has been stored in a shed you know, or, or an attic, or, or sorry, in someone's roof or something like that. It's got that really fine sort of, you know, gritty dust all over it. It's the sort of stuff you find if you get up into the ceiling, you know. Um, right, uh, I want to just have a quick look at this motor here. I mean, all of this stuff I'm going to, um, I'm going to clean. So we, if we push that there and push that, hang on, that out. Just got to remember, it's a while since I've done this. That, that, and that. Yeah, then they close. And as you can see, that's really, really slow. You see how it's almost like a slow, you know, sort of a soft, a soft closed cupboard or something like that. Uh, it needs massive cleaning, so that's all good. But you know, let's just see what the uh, the eject is like. One screw. This comes out, and then we just disconnect this plug here. Three little 
plugs there. And this is the guy here. He feels like he's still intact. Uh, do you have a recommended gear replacement for the floppy drive motors? I, there's a place where I buy it from here in Australia. I've bought stacks. I've got heaps of them here because um, I had an opportunity to buy a whole bunch of them uh, and save some dollars by buying a whole bunch of them. You can't really see them because it's white on white. But if I did that, there you can see them. So I've got a whole bunch of them here to last me a long time. And these are really, really good quality. Now, it's my understanding that the person who got these made, what he did was he got the 3D model, he sent it to 3D model to China, got them professionally 3D printed uh, in, you know, like by a resin printer in, uh, in China. And obviously that gave him a very good per unit price. And then he started selling them on eBay. Um, and I bought a big batch from him. He's someone that I've, I've, I've had contact with for other things. I think I've even done some recapping for him maybe, but, um, and they're really, really good, but that's Australia. Uh, when it comes to, um, in the U S there is, uh, a, a, like an online seller that does have quite good ones. Um, so yeah, the, the, I, I don't have the link here, but if you go to eBay and search for, I don't know, floppy eject gear or something like that, um, you'll find them, but, uh, I lose them like no tomorrow. Yeah. So anyhow, we've just taken this off. We can see that we've got the, the cogs here. Um, I might zoom in a little bit so that we can get a better view of this. Sorry about the wobbly camera. That's zooming out. There we go. There we go. Too much. There we go. So um, when we have a look at that, we can see that we've got these gears here and you've got this one here, which is a different color. Now, the reason why this one is a different color is because it was made from a different material and that was not an accident. It was made by a a, from a different material because it is designed as a fail safe in the mechanism. So when we lift this up, and you can see the green here, that green is the corrosion from this, you know, whatever it is, brass copper, whatever they're getting onto this eject gear. But these have a little motor, which is here. Now, if this motor seizes, so in other words, if this motor is getting power but stops moving, it melts. I know because I've got one around somewhere, melted. Uh, and so you essentially will destroy this motor if it seizes. Um, this gear is designed to be the break point to save the motor in the event of um, a, 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 some sort of seizure. So... Um, so this was made from, deliberately made from softer plastic and just in the process of trying to remove it now, I've just broken it. So I'm just going to go to the microscope view and you'll see what I'm talking about. You can see, I just took a, a, a little peg off it there trying to remove it. So I'm, I'm just trying to get under it here and just trying to lift it up and it's just breaking. There we go. So it is, it was always designed to be softer but time has not been kind and it is now the consistency of a good quality aged cheese something like a parmesan or maybe a pecorino um and uh, yeah it is absolutely if i just i'm just going to put my fingers on either side of it and push down and there we go very 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 soft so um so anyhow, that does need to be replaced. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. <laughs> I think that if this did actually run one single eject, it would have broken, but it hasn't run an eject because it hasn't been working. And this, all of this grease here needs to be replaced too because it's gone really, really sticky, like a glue. Um, so, um, so anyhow, there we go. That's that's the floppy drive. We know that. We're going to have to clean off the whole mechanism. If anyone is ever wanting to know how to do that, I do have a video on the topic. Um, and so I've, I basically go through the whole process of of dismantling the whole thing and, um, and then fixing it all and cleaning it and then putting it all back together again. There is a video uh, in my, I think it's in my featured videos possibly on my channel. So if anyone wants to do that, have a look. Then, um, uh, Micromage Repair, hello, thank you for joining. Um, 
So, um, one thing I did want to mention that I, I sort of touched on very lightly in that, in that video that I did. Um, this is the head here, and he travels backwards and forwards along this metal shaft. And you can see here, this metal shaft. And then he, he moves by this motor. This motor is a little worm gear, spins around, and there's a little bit of metal here that's grabbing onto it. And as that spins, it sends this head backwards and forwards. And that's how it, that the head travels backwards and forwards. Now, the way it knows where it is is based on kind of like a home position. So it spins back until it reaches the home position, and then that's it knows where to start from. And it knows its home position because of this thing. This is a little optical interrupter. So there's a little like infrared light or whatever that shines here, and then there's a little gap. You might, you might even be able to see see the there's no you can't really see it very well it's in there there's a gap and then there's this plastic piece in between and that plastic piece is attached to this head so as it travels backwards and forwards when it when that little plastic piece runs in between this optic interrupter optical interrupter it knows it's in home position now here's where it gets interesting this interrupter can move it can be you know uh, configured you can actually undo this screw and slide it backwards and forwards by a, a, about a, probably about a millimeter maybe two millimeters of travel and sometimes when you get hold of these this isn't in the right position and it's just a simple matter of getting that into the right home position to then be able to read discs again the only problem is it's not a simple process because although i'm sure sony had some sort of thing that they can connect it up to with the, with a a big old fancy, you know, sort of um, oscilloscope or something, and then they can exactly configure where that home position is. I haven't found anything like that for these drives. And so if you do have this that in the wrong position, the only way you fix it is by undoing this little screw, moving it a tiny bit, plugging it in, trying it, doesn't work, move it a little bit more, and you just go through it over and over again. And you can't hot, hot swap these either. You've got to switch the computer off when you unplug them and plug them in. So I have done it, but it's not a fun job. So, yeah, just saying. Um, okay, so we replace the gears with a new one. Are we running the risk of melting motors? Potentially, yes, because we really... I don't know what the how easily these ones fail. People with these replacement gears are probably more concerned with whether they're going to last than whether they will work as that breakpoint gear. <coughs> so I think the short answer is um, we are running the risk of melting the motor with these, yes. Um, so my sort of, I would say that if you're having to replace the gear with a 3D printed one in these, uh, just be careful you don't seize up the mechanism. Um, Cause yeah. Hello Steve, how's things? Everyone, welcome Steve from Mac84. I'm sure none of you have ever heard of him before. He has this uh, little YouTube channel. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, just a little quick little recap, Steve, just to let you know where we are. Um, I got this Macintosh SE30, uh, it, and uh, the reason why it's special, I mentioned I called it special in the live stream. The reason it's special is because it's mine. And I bought it, and I got it, and it's mine, and it's no one else's. And I um, <coughs> opened it up. The board is in remarkably good condition, though very, very dirty. There's no sound. It has jail bars, but it hasn't been recapped. So I'm pretty sure a recap will fix all that. So here we go. Here's a little look. You can see there's a fair bit of corrosion around here. You can see there's lots and lots of dirt. I mean, look at this. Look at this dirt. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, yes. Um, no battery leakage, it had a battery in it, but there was no leakage there. It had two megabytes of RAM installed, so it had eight 256K SIMs in it. Uh, it looks like it has been tampered with, it's had its hard drive replaced. I am, I am going to try and get the hard drive working, it's a 40 megabyte quantum. We've established that it's almost definitely not the original drive. Um, and we replaced some caps on it that appeared to be bad, but it's still dead as just doesn't work at all. So I'm gonna hunt around on all of my old vintage hard drives and see if I can find a replacement controller. Now I could do that now, but I'm just very concerned about, you know, doing that sort of stuff while I'm on live stream that everyone might just go get bored. So we've got one of two options. 
that we can move forward with. And I will open it up to the chatting world to tell me what they want me to do. At this particular point, I can do one of two things. I can start to recap this SE30, whether I get it finished or not, we'll see, but I can start to recap it. Uh, the other thing I can do is I can press the back soon button and quickly duck up and have a look at all of my hard drives and see if I can find a 40 megabyte and see if we can actually find a replacement controller and potentially get this hard drive spinning again. So what I would say is for people, if they would like to just uh, put in their little vote right now and say, so the choices are hard drive or recap, hard drive or recap. And so the downside of the hard drive is I will need to press the back soon button and go and have a quick look for some hard drives. Shouldn't take me more than a couple of minutes. I know where all the hard drives are. Uh, I may not even find what I'm looking for, but I'm pretty sure I will find it. So we've got two votes for hard drive. Three votes for hard drive. One for recap. One for three for a recap. So we're right down the middle at the moment. Hard drive, hard drive, hard drive. Recap, recap, recap. Hard drive, now four, five, okay. We've now got five for hard drive, three for recap. Hello, Patrick Pitts. It's another Patrick. We've got lots of Patricks here today. Uh, oh, John Revels here. Hello, John, how are you? I didn't even see your turn up. Sorry about that. Recap, recap, recap a hard drive. <laughs> I already recapped the hard drive. All right, well, I feel like there's enough, enough interest on the hard drive for me to go and have a quick look. If I don't find what I'm looking for in about 60 seconds, I'll come back. So just bear with me. I'll be back soon. Just remember this back soon music is sometimes a bit loud. So you may want to grab, reach for that volume control. Back in a moment. Okay, now I found this one. He's got his head missing, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> um, now this is not exactly the same. It's very, very close. It's not exactly the same. We've got the capacitors in a slightly different position near the power, but these ones are, I should go back to the top view, shouldn't I? Uh, top view, no one wants to see me mug. Okay, let's see if we can zoom out a little bit here. We've done the, there we go. There we go, that'll do. So, you can see they're very, very similar here in terms of layout. Um, these caps here are slightly staggered. Um, so what I'm thinking is, could I just swap that over and maybe swap this as like a firmware chip or something like that, put that into that and swap the board over. What do peeps think? Shall we give it a try? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? It will destroy the computer. Uh, let's first of all swap over the little firmware chippy thingy, because I am hoping that that's the thing that tells it's a 40 megabyte drive, and it's not gonna get confused and think it's a different size drive. Will I lose any important? No, no. I mean, at the moment, I have no idea what's on this drive. Get in there, you. Okay. 
So there's that one from that one, 407. This one from this one, which is like, I suspect this one is an 80. Uh, that would just be my guess. Hmm. And pop that one in there. And just, yeah, as I say, the hope is that that little chip holds the information about the drive and that everything else is the same. So, time to do the surgery. If this works, I'll flip out. So will I. I'm just annoyed I wasted two perfectly good low ESR um, capacitors there. Very frustrating. These uh, pins are a little bit mangled. That's easy enough to resolve. So these are the uh, the SCSI selector pins here. We have one labelled A0, one labelled A1, and one labelled A2. Um, and these are how you tell it what SCSI ID you want it. They just work in binary. So as in like 000, 001, 010, 011. Um, 100, 101, 110, 111. And so basically with, with three binary selectors here, it gives you up to eight different options. So all off will be ID zero, all on is ID seven. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven gives you eight combinations. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Um, very easy way if you're wanting to figure out what address they are on. The easiest way is think of them as zero, no, one, two, and four. So A zero, that's one. A one is two. A two is four. So, and then you just, whichever one you clipped on, you just add that up. So if you've got position one and position four, if you've got a jumper on those, it's giving you ID five. If you're on one and four, sorry, one, one and two, add those together, you end up with three. I oh, gotta have that made sense. I just felt like at the end of that sentence, it was just coming out like gibberish. Righty, righty, righty. So we've got to undo our little ribbon cable here. Ouch, come. And same here. Ouch, come. Well, that's all, uh, it's sponge. It's uh, not sponge anymore. <laughs> it's deteriorated a little. Just a little. Okay, so swapping him to over here. This uh, provides the power for the spinny, spinny, spinny. A vault around his watch. Binary makes sense to me. Oh, that's good. I like it when binary makes sense to others. Of course, the whole thing with the SCSI selection, I mean, we got very, very good at knowing how that all worked back in the day because it's what we used. It's what we had. And so it was sort of like, you know, not everyone, but certainly people in a technical position knew exactly how all the SCSI side of things worked, the IDs and all them sorts of things and stuff and things. Right. Connect our little ribbon cable back up again. 
and then we'll hit it with some power and just see what it does. I just, you know, I grabbed this hard drive out of the bin. For all I know, this hard drive could be stuffed as well. I mean, yes, the hard drive is stuffed. It doesn't have a lid on it, but I mean, the controller could be stuffed as well. Right, you wait here. Uh, power supply. that and then let's give this some power and see what happens well it's spinning it sounds terrible Well, let's put it in the computer and see if it does anything. There's only one way to find that out. Righty, righty, righty. I really should sort out this floppy drive first, shouldn't I? I'll at least put it back together even though it doesn't have a cog in there. I have mentioned a couple of times before that there are there is another company here in Australia selling replacement cogs for this. Um, and they are green. Don't buy them. I bought a whole bunch from them and they didn't work. They weren't made very well and they actually clogged up the eject mechanism. Uh, and then that particular uh, seller blocked me. So I don't really have anything nice to say about them. Right, so at least put him in one piece there, got him all together so we can look at him Another day. Well, I mean, I'll probably do it later today, but I may not do it in the live stream. Um, bits. I did have a container full of bits. I can go in with the container full of bits. There we go. And we'll get this floppy drive, put him here. Whoopsie. things over here. One of the problems whenever you're working with these sorts of things, you just end up with bits everywhere. And it's like, are these important bits? Do I need to keep these bits? Or do I throw these bits away? Will I one day want these bits? So obviously I'm not actually looking to, to keep this hard drive going. I'm going to replace this with a blue SCSI or a SCSI to SD, one of the two. Um, but I do want to, um, I want to see if there's anything of historical value on there. I'm not actually looking to look through people's private stuff or anything like that, but I just want if there are drivers or if there are software or utilities or, you know, control panels or whatever that have been lost and they're not likely to be. I mean, this had nothing installed on it, so I'm not likely to find any drivers, but, you know, just like to check and see. I'm using my known good working SE30 board here. I've got a really long SCSI cable somewhere. I might grab that. Ouch. Hit it again. Okay, here's my long SCSI cable. Let's move this. Seeing as I've kicked it twice now. There we go. No more kicking. Shh. 
Okay, I probably need to zoom out a little bit. We're still a bit zoomed in here, aren't we? Don't want to go too much. Don't want to just see exactly how messy the desk is. Oops. Ah. He's there. And you want to see where I put the hard drive? Come on. I'm not even joking. Where to put the hard drive? It's over there. Uh. Oh, it's hang hanging down here. It's all right. Do 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 do. Do 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 do. Okay. Pop him inside there. Nice and safe. Ish. Safe ish. It's the best I can do. Connect that there and then I might even just change views here I think it'll probably work better with a front view Jesus windy out all right so that's hard drive is connected no shorts there he's got power he's got scuzzy he's connected there we've got RAM nothing else is unplugged good all right, so let's see what happens. Won't get any sound because I don't have the sound connected. Spin rin, spin rin, rin, rin. Oh! His <laughs> password protected. Bastard! <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to get around this. I might be able to get around this. Does anyone anyone know anything about Norton Disc Lock? Anyone? Sorry, that was me. Did that. Bastard. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> what does it say? I can't read it. Enter password for... What, should I just try like password or something? The hope is that if I can actually boot from an external device, the security won't apply. The security only works on startup. That's the hope. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but we are going to proceed with that premise because I'll tell you what, this hard drive sounds like he's dying. But what it does tell us is the hard drive is working. It's not like that thing would fire up if the hard drive wasn't working. So that's reward in itself okay so we're going to try and boot from an external device here this is my scuzzy to sd version 5.5 which i'm currently out of stock of but i will get some soon my apologies boot from external your thing do it there we go that's flickering Oh, you dog. You dog cow. I think I'm having some issues with my SCSI 2SD, to be quite honest with you. I think I need to probably run a bit of a, a Norton's on it. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Um, 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 Let's try it with the extensions off for starters. Well, I don't think it'll do much, but... Because the, the SCSI to SD is flickering, but then it just doesn't seem to boot from it, so, which suggests... To, uh, no, that didn't work. Um, what if... What if... Boot from the floppy emu? I could do that. It's behind me, isn't it? It's behind you! So, let's switch him off. Sorry, noisy chickens, noisy chickens. Floppy emu in place. Now this is running an operating system, should run on an SE, so it should run an SE30, I would think. Mm, 
Well, stop. Why didn't it boot from the floppy? All right, we're gonna try some desperate measures here. I don't like doing this, but I'm going to. Get rid of this. Oh, the image was already selected, so. Eh. Right. Okay, we're just gonna try this. Hard drive is a whiny bitch. Now, is it going to boot from my SCSI to SD? Yes, okay, so we are now booting from the SCSI to SD. We don't have this connected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hot connect this SCSI and then hopefully be able to mount it using SCSI to S using um, SCSI probe. But there's a few risks involved. Are the SCSI IDs in the correct order? Well, this one is definitely zero because it's got no, no jumpers on it. This over here, I think, is ID five or six or something. So we should be fine. Okay, there we go. So we've got that. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to plug this in and... What it will probably do is it'll probably make the computer freeze, but we'll try. Let's get my mousey. Where's my mousey? There it is. Oh, he's still he's still uh, he's still alive, but I suspect that when I go to SCSI probe, it will be upset at me. I'm doing this in a very, very unproductive way here. Okay, so we've got the quantum there at zero, and then we've got my one here at six. I heard it go click. Hasn't frozen. Come on. You know you want to. I hear the drive go click but it's not mounting. Let's try something else here. It's making noises, definitely talking to it. Uh, I want hard disk toolkit because that's got a mounter as well. I cannot even begin to tell you how difficult this is. I'm watching the screen coming through the camera here. Change the startup device to SCSI to SD and reboot. You can try it. I don't think it'll work, but I can try it. Okay, so there we go. Volume it says NA. Why does it say NA? It's almost like when this is plugged in, that drive becomes unrecognizable. I think that's what will happen. We'll just, let's just see. We'll see. Are we, we're going to go with the suggestions here. Uh, startup disk. And startup disk will be system 7.1 disk 1. I wonder if that Norton utility actually makes the drive unrecognizable unless it boots with the password and whatnot and i'm just guessing norton did something in the volume so you can't mount it without norton it is it is highly likely yeah see it's still just booted straight from that hmm p a s s w o r d no, wrong password. Oh, that's no good. Um, one, two, three, four, five. I only one, 
two, three, three. Oh, my three button doesn't work. Oh my goodness, the three button on my keyboard doesn't work. I can't even put type in a proper password. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, no, the, you, you make a very valid point there, Toby. There's probably, there's probably some uh, sensitive data on this here, which, of course, I would not um, live stream. I, um, yeah, I don't like being locked out of things, though. Not, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> you'd enter. Yeah, we should always try that. Wrong password. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day... Um, we could sit here guessing passwords for an eternity, but I, um, um, I am going to assume that they didn't just have a simple one. Admin, how about that? A, D. But D key doesn't work either. Oh, hang on. Did I get it? D. D. No. This keyboard is munted. I'm going to have to uh, get another keyboard down here because this one is terrible. Um, call Margaret. <laughs> Excuse me, Margaret. Just curious, could you please send me the password? And I'm just wondering whether if I boot it from the, the SCSI to SD and then maybe run something like Norton Utilities on it, whether there's something I can do there. But anyhow, well, that's about as far as I can get with the drive. On the bright side of things, we did manage to get it spinning. We do know we can get it working. We do know it's got a password protection on it. Um, Mr. McIntosh, hello. So anyhow, what are we going, how are we doing for time here? I've been going for about two hours. It's around about how long I wanted to go for. So I may end up just calling it a day now, go up and get some work done. Um, but we'll just do a little wrap up here and then see whether I'm motivated to do something else. See whether everyone's motivated for me to be motivated. But on the whole, um, pretty good, pretty rewarding stuff. I mean, we've got an SE30 here. Um, it's one that I know I'm going to be able to fix. Um, it doesn't have any burn-in. Uh, I'm probably going to recap everything. I'll recap the analog board and, oh God, the analog board's going to be a nightmare. There's so much hot glue. There's so much gooey stuff holding those caps in. Never mind. Um, I'll probably recap the analog board and the power supply and the logic board, do the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of research on whether there are ways that you can hack into Norton Disk Lock. Um, let's use the sectors right after this. To, yeah. So if you can be able to alter the boot sectors from zero, to be able to catch it. Well, I really don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if I were to install... Um, hard disk toolkit driver, you know, an alternative driver on there, because obviously you have you have a tool like hard disk toolkit, and when you put it in there, you have the option to install driver and actually go in and install its driver onto a drive. And I wonder if I did something like that, whether that'd free it up. But who knows? Sector edit the contents of the disk. I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> um, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I have done something like that, but yeah. Uh, Oh, cool, I got a thumbs down. Awesome. Hello to whoever thumbs down me. Thank you very much for your dedication. Um, okay. But, look, we got this working with a different controller. Sorry, I'm just giving you the bird. We got this going with a different controller um, that's stolen from another computer, and I just swapped out the little what, kind of firmware chip or whatever that is, and it worked, and I'm really, really happy about that. Um, this drive is going to die in the not too distant future, but if I can get some data off it before then, that would be fantastic. I will probably do further work on that on a different computer if I'm going to work on it, rather than that SC30, a little bit easier. Uh, band thumbs down guy. Yeah, I don't know who it is, but as I say, it's nice to see the dedication there. It's like, uh, you know, someone's actually going to the trouble of going onto the stream and giving you a thumbs down. It's like, yeah, I am getting under that person's skin. Um, right, so, okay, I'm going to start, I'm just going to start pulling this thing apart, which is my, uh, my floppy drive, and then I, I'll get some of this stuff ready for cleaning, and then I'll probably call it a day. So, anyone who's watched my live stream will see that, see how I do this. 
Um, oh, and by the way, of course, don't forget to uh, smash, smash that, that like button. button. Um, I need to, uh, first the thing I need to do is close, oh, we're not looking at top view, there we go. First thing I need to do is close it as if there was a disc in there. And so I do that by going like this down. Then I remove this little plastic thing here, which is the thing that makes the head lift up. Goodbye. Uh, then I need to remove this carriage here. And I do that by going patoing with that spring and patoing with that spring. And then we just give this a little bit of a, a wiggle and a, a wiggle and out she comes. And this is going to need to be thoroughly cleaned because it's all very stiff and yucky. Um, and then this part as well, that needs to be, I mean, this is, oh, wow, that's so scungy. Yeah. So I'm just going to whip off these little rubber or plastic or whatever they're made of um, things. You know, the things, little washers, things. Off they come. And, uh, and of course, this will all get cleaned and then we'll put it all back together again with uh, some nice new grease. Oh, I've, got, I've got to take the eject gear off. Me forgets. Me forgets. When I'm giving these a good old proper clean, um, I do like to uh, obviously take that off. I'll usually also take this part off here, give this a good clean. Um, undo that screw there, undo that screw there. And then this can just come out from the side like that. And then we can disconnect that from there. And we'll get a good old Good old clean on all of that. So we clean all the old grease off that and put new stuff on. You can obviously go to the lengths of removing the heads. You can undo these here and take the little shaft off and clean and stuff like that. I, don't, I might go to those lengths, we'll see. Let's see what the heads look like. We'll have a look at them under the microscope. Here we go. That comes a little metal shafty bit. And then that there, we just need to give that a really good clean. I won't put this whole thing in the ultrasonic cleaner only because it's got this sort of motor here and I'd just be really worried about getting trapped moisture under there and, and causing some corrosion. So I'm just going to clean this manually with a toothbrush, get that as all as clean as I possibly can. Toothbrush and ISO alcohol. Being very careful not to damage these little switches. These are little micro switches that tells the, the thing whether there is a disc in there. And if there is a disc in there, uh, is it a standard uh, density or a high density? So, um, and then we'll just have a quick look at this under the microscope. Yeah, Steve, when's, when's, I haven't seen a stream from you in a while, Steve. We tried to talk him into doing it yesterday and he wouldn't. Um, so, there we go. There are the heads. There's two little heads there. So, you know, very gently lift this up and then a bit of cotton butter, a Q-tip with some alcohol in between there and clean those out. And I'll generally try and clean a lot of this grit off around the outside as well. But when you're working with this, you've got to be super, super, super careful with it. Very, very easy to damage these and make it so that they will never work again. But look at that crunchy, crunchy grease on there. Ooh. That all needs cleaning. Um, okay, well, I think that's it. I'm not gonna go and do a whole recap at this stage, otherwise I'll lose another hour and I don't, uh, unfortunately don't have the luxury of, uh, the same luxury of time as I, as I do when I'm doing a lot of my weekend live streams. Um, Mr. Macintosh will be streaming after Bruce. I'll be installing the Mac OS Big Sur 11.6 update. I already have three viewers, or is it minus three viewers? <laughs> um, cool, okay, there you go, Mr. Macintosh, you're gonna be live streaming. Um, so yeah, that takes the pressure off Steve. <laughs> 
Um, shout out to Mr. Macintosh, some great content on there. So uh, do uh, jump on and have a look at that. So, okay, uh, as usual, uh, I'll do my normal thank yous. Thank you for, to everyone for joining me here. Um, uh, as I say, it's midweek one, which is a little bit unusual for me, or start of week for some people, but uh, it's Tuesday here. Um, I will probably post some pics on Facebook when I get this board all cleaned up and when I get rid of those jail bar things. Um, I don't think I'll be able to wait for another live stream to do that. I'm too excited. I'll probably do it tonight, but uh, uh, I'll get that all working so that I have another working Macintosh SE30 and then I have to figure out, do I need two? Probably not. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Alrighty, well thank you everyone for joining, uh, I do appreciate it, thanks for all the likes, if you haven't liked, please like, um, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, well if you've been chatting you would have had to subscribe, but I think, um, and uh, I will hopefully see you at the next one, thanks for keeping me company, and have a really good one, and I'll see you all later, bye. Yeah.